Edgefield Stoneware in the Mets American Wing. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here today. I am so grateful to everyone at the Decorative Arts Trust and Classical American Homes Preservation Trust for the opportunity to share some of the work I've been doing over the past year and change at the Met Museum in my role as the Peggy N. Gary Research Scholar, a position supported jointly by the Decorative Arts Trust and the Mets American Wing. I've had the great pleasure of getting to work with the American Wing on a number of projects during my time here, including research on these wonderful John Bell Lyon figures and assisting curator Nani Frelinghausen with examining incoming acquisitions and writing labels, and it's really been an incredible experience. What I am going to focus on today is the project that makes up the majority of my work with the wing, which is working with assistant research curator Adrian Spinozzi on an upcoming exhibition that will be focused on the 19th century alkaline glazed stoneware from an area called Edgefield District in South Carolina. And I'll say now that with our limited time this morning, this is really just the briefest of overviews of the work I've been doing. So really just consider this a tiny teaser for the exhibition and catalog to come in 2022. So when we think of the American Wing at the Met, we usually are thinking about objects like these, which I am sure you all recognize. And if we're talking about ceramics at the American Wing, what usually comes to mind for most people are objects like these, which are all made of porcelain objects like the Tucker vase or the Century vase, or even possibly this porcelain teapot by John Bartlam, made before the revolution and likely the first instance of porcelain being successfully made in North America, not in Philadelphia, by the way, but down in South Carolina, which I think is actually very apt as it's maybe the initial sign that there is something about South Carolina that is going to be incredibly important to the history of pottery and ceramics and entrepreneurship in that place. But we're not here to discuss high style porcelain. Instead, we want to talk about stoneware. So here we are. This is not at all what we are used to seeing in the American wing galleries. And this is just a smattering of what 19th century Edgefield stoneware can look like, but I think it gives a great idea of the many different forms and sizes and shapes and glazes that can be found comprising this material. What you're seeing on the screen here is a group of objects that are coming out of a number of different collections, both in public institutions and museums, as well as private collections that I've been fortunate to see. And every object currently on the screen, with the exception, maybe, of the face vessels towards the top, is a utilitarian object that was made with a definite function and use in mind. Aesthetically, the reason they look so very different from the other ceramics in the American wing is because these stoneware pieces are all alkaline glazed, which is a completely different type of process and glaze than the salt glaze, which was so prevalent in the mid-Atlantic and Northeast. In order to really understand why this pottery production is so innovative and becomes so monumental, out in what is really backcountry South Carolina at the very start of the 19th century, we need to back up for a minute and give you a better understanding of the place that we are talking about. The town of Edgefield still exists today, as does Edgefield County. And on this map, you can see it located on the southwest border of South Carolina, where it abuts Georgia. But when I say Edgefield District, I'm really referring to the old Edgefield District, which was the much larger area that was mapped out in 1825 in Robert Mills' Atlas of South Carolina, and that in the years after the Civil War was split into five counties. So on this 1825 map, you can actually see two different potteries referenced, one being the Reverend John Landrum's pottery off of Shaw's Creek, and the other being the pottery of Landrumsville, run by his brother Abner Landrum, and which was also known as Pottersville. 
And Pottersville is thought to really be the first pottery that begins in the area around 1810. And one of the things that happens at Pottersville in Edgefield in the 1810s is that the receipt or recipe for alkaline glaze, which is previously only known in Asia, shows up for the first time in North America. And it happens in Edgefield, South Carolina. And there are many reasons that pottery and ceramics become this super successful endeavor in this area in particular. And it's a combination of politics and current events, the War of 1812 and trade and commerce, combined with the geology of the area, the clay and kaolin that's available, and the availability of certain kinds of hardwoods for firing the kilns, and a number of other factors, including this new technology that's being used both in terms of the glazes, but then also the actual pottery kilns and how they are being built. And so this image you see here on the screen doesn't look like much, but it's actually a huge key to our current understanding of Edgefield's 19th century pottery production. This is a 2011 image of an archeological excavation that was being conducted at that time. And the result of this work was the discovery that the kiln built at Pottersville, the earliest pottery site in Edgefield that we know of, was actually well over 100 feet long. To put this into perspective, most kilns in America at that time are roughly 10 to maybe 30 feet in length at most. This discovery, which would not have been possible without the work of archaeologists, is really mind-blowing on many levels. But the one that reason that I really want to focus on today is that if you were working with a 100-foot pottery kiln, the amount of labor needed to build that kiln, create the pots that then have to be loaded into it, and then fire that kiln, and keep it at firing temperature for multiple days, is enormous. And that's really the crux of how and why the Edgefield pottery production achieved the scale and success that it did at this time. Because in addition to everything else, all of the other reasons I mentioned um, earlier, the labor was available and it was free because the labor force was mostly made up of enslaved African Americans. But who were these people? So probably the best known name associated with Edgefield stoneware is that of David Drake or Dave. He was an African-American man born in South Carolina circa 1800, who was both an immensely talented potter as well as being literate. And that's really important to this story because during Dave's life in antebellum South Carolina, it was illegal for an enslaved person to know how to read or write, and anti-literacy laws in South Carolina became even more stringent in 1834 with the passing of the slave literacy law which is just about the same time that we start to see pots that were being made by Dave and inscribed with his name, with the date, and then on occasion with a word or verse or poem. So to bring this back to the American wing for a moment and the work that I'm actively doing while I'm there, this is the front and back view of one of Dave's larger storage jars, currently on view in the Civil War and Reconstruction Eras and Legacies Gallery. It is dated April 21st, 1858, and it has six lines of verse inscribed on both sides, along with the date, with Dave's name, and with 25 slashes that indicate that this storage jar holds 25 gallons worth of foodstuff, possibly pork or beef, because Dave literally tells us, quote, when you fill this jar with pork or beef, Scott will be there to get a piece, end quote. And that piece is spelled P-E-A-C-E. -E. It's been amazing to see the reaction of museum guests when they see Dave's storage jar on view in the gallery and how fascinated people are by it. I was giving a tour to some international students from countries in Asia a few weeks ago, and these college kids just could not get over that this storage jar was made in South Carolina in the 1800s and not, say, in Japan in perhaps the 12th century. So knowing that the Met does not have a major Edgefield stoneware collection already, 
In conducting research for the exhibit, I've been really fortunate to be able to take advantage of the generous stipend that the Decorative Arts Trust provides in order to travel to see Edgefield stoneware in various collections around the country, including down at the Charleston Museum, where they have the two largest known Dave jars, each roughly 40 gallons and dated the same day, which you can see I'm looking at in the image on the right. And so this here is a visit to the Chipstone Gallery at the Milwaukee Art Museum, where we were talking with John Prown about interpretation of Edgefield face vessels. I think I've gone on at least nine or 10 different dedicated trips at this point and visited well over 40 different institutions and archives and private collections. And the reason that this sort of travel is so necessary and vital to this project is that since the Met does not have a major collection of Edgefield, it is slowly growing, but it's nothing like the early collections housed at regional institutions such as the Charleston Museum or the McKissick Museum or even the South Carolina State Museum. So the opportunity to really handle and study as much of the original material firsthand is invaluable to our understanding of the pottery and the material and the history. On one of our more recent trips to South Carolina this past fall, Adrian and I were accompanied by our Met colleagues Wendy Walker and Adriana Rizzo, who are, respectively, a ceramics conservator and a scientist who are working on the ex exhibition with us. And here we are at the McKissick Museum at the University of South Carolina in Columbia, South Carolina, using a number of different tools to examine the interior of some of these vessels and conduct scientific analysis on some of these Edgefield objects that came into the McKissick collection really very early on in the 20th century when Edgefield stoneware was still very much a regional interest. And so what's amazing about these objects is that because they entered collections so very early, they kind of came in and were never really cleaned per se, which is fascinating, but also amazing because it connects us right back to their original purpose, which was food storage and preparation. So some of the jugs I really especially love because they still have this really strong smell of molasses coming from the inside. And so what you're seeing me doing here is actually take a very small residue sample, which you can really see with the use of the black light. And then Adriana, the scientist we work with, was kind enough to let me try this out, even though it quickly became clear that I think I'll stay on the curatorial side of things. So I'm taking this small sample of residue material, and then we are actually sending it to a lab in Bordeaux, France, that specializes in analysis of organic materials in the hopes of determining exactly what was being held in this particular vessel. And so this is one of those things that's just amazing about getting to work with the Met because they have the resources and the expertise that really enables us to do analysis like this that just takes things one step further. There's certainly been a lot of research done on antebellum southern foodways, and we pretty much do know that most Edgefield storage jars were likely being used for storing lard and various types of meat, sometimes pickled vegetables. But this is a chance to really build on some of the work that has come before. And to that end, I really want to take a moment to say that the research I'm currently doing for this project really is building on the work of a number of previous exhibitions and scholarship that has been done in the past. I find it fascinating that although this is a new direction of research for the American wing, the Met actually did have a 19th century Edgefield face vessel come into the collection in 1922, which is the little guy that you see on the left side of your screen. The other two face vessels are much more recent acquisitions in 2017 and 2019, and I'm going to refrain from doing a deep dive on Edgefield face vessels right now, but I do want to touch on them briefly, mostly to give you a little glimpse of one of the first things I worked on when I arrived at the museum last fall. So, this is the board that has been my constant companion since the beginning of my time at the museum. And what it is, is a visual collection of the roughly 200 or so extant face vessels that I know of that are believed to be from 19th century Edgefield. There are a lot of questions surrounding 19th century Edgefield face vessels. Why they were made, who they were made for, which potteries they were made at. So it's been a great exercise in close looking, going back to the object, to do some visual analysis and comparison of these different forms. 
And I think that even in this partial photo of photos, you can start to see how I'm looking for similarities and comparisons and perhaps beginning to see some real clues as to groups of face vessels that may have been made by the same hand, by the same maker. And I'm sure you all who are watching can find others in addition to the few that I highlighted here. So while we're on the subject of Edgefield face vessels, I do also want to call attention to another grouping of objects that are now in the Mets collection, which are the Harvest face vessel that came into the collection in 2017, along with two stereographic images taken by American photographer James A. Palmer that feature a very similar face vessel. It's not exactly the same. If you look really closely, you can tell as the face in, the face vessel in the images has a pronounced chin and more almond-shaped eyes, whereas the one that's now at the Met does not have that chin and has very round eyes. And you can see the first of the two Palmer images here on the screen, and then here. Here is the second featuring a woman, but the same face vessel. And there is a lot to unpack in these images. They are pretty highly disturbing to our modern sensibilities, and the more I learn about them, the more upsetting I think that they become. We know that there's a definite parody going on of the Harper's Weekly cover that was published in early 1882, um, which is here on the screen to the right, which was making fun of Oscar Wilde and his involvement in the aesthetic movement. And the Harper's Weekly illustration was titled The Aesthetic Monkey. And the Palmer image has a handwritten title of an aesthetic darky on the label on the back. The two Palmer images are currently the earliest visual record that we know of that depict Edgefield face vessels. And we believe there's a connection with the American tour Oscar Wilde was doing in America in 1882, stopping at cities in the South, such as Aiken, South Carolina, which is where the photographer Palmer was based, and, these, and where these studio, studio images of his are actually part of a much larger group that he called his Aiken and Vicinity series. I've been able to travel to archives and libraries to work with some of the larger repositories of these images, and they are fascinating on so very many levels. There's certainly a lot more research to be done on Palmer and on this image series, but I just want to point out how they are taken in Aiken in the 1880s, which is one of the counties that was previously part of Edgefield District. And there's really a great importance to the fact that the first documented image of a face vessel we're seeing is not only an image that is taken in Aiken, but really is meant as a representation of Aiken, a completely racist and very upsetting image. But the images that Palmer took that were then made into these stereographs were being marketed for northern tourists visiting Aiken which by the 1880s was known as a popular winter vacation spot for wealthy northerners. And honestly, this could be a whole other talk and hopefully someday will be, but these images were all completely romanticized versions of, quote, the Old South, very much this gone with the wind type nostalgia. And I think that these two pictures I have on the screen right now, which are from another one of Palmer's series of photographs called Characteristic Southern Scenes, is just very telling in that the bottom one is literally titled a picturesque log cabin when we know it's very possible it's former slave quarters from before the war. Clearly a sense of place is really vital to this research and this material and this image here of the main square in the town of Edgefield is obviously not from the 1880s. It's one that I took back last year on one of our numerous trips to South Carolina, and yet we've still got all sorts of history wrapped up in it. So to the right over here, you've got the Edgefield County Courthouse where David Drake registered to vote in 1867. And then over to the left on the square, You've got your typical uh, Confederate memorial, in addition to a statue of Edgefield's own Strom Thurmond right here, you can see him there, um, the South Carolina senator and politician who fought for segregation well into the 20th century. And so that's the thing about Edgefield. 
It's wrapped up in so many different histories, and it is such a juxtaposition of literacy and agency and resistance and freedom. And then this large-scale industrial slavery and an incredible amount of violence towards African Americans during Reconstruction and then well into the 20th century. And it's one thing to read about all of this at your desk, but another to really go out and experience that place and visit the sites where the stoneware was made and the world in which it existed. Just outside of Edgefield, there are still extant waster piles that exist from a number of the 19th century pottery sites. These images here are at the former site of Benjamin Franklin Landrum's pottery, which is now owned and protected by the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. It's really like stepping back in time, and being able to travel here gives such a direct connection with the material when I'm back in the office combing through records on ancestry. This is a lump of kaolin, and in the background you can see Sean Taylor, who is a senior archaeologist for the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources, um, that's his hand in the background, pulling out kaolin near a stream at the BF Landrum site. So this is the same clay seam that the enslaved potters would likely have been pulling from at this pottery during the 1850s. One of the threads of conversation that keeps coming up with my colleagues at the Met and at other institutions is the importance of the environment and of this very visceral connection with the land and the material. And I think it may in part be my background in architecture, but there's just something about an understanding of sense of place that grounds you in a very different way when you are able to walk on the same land that the materials you're researching were made on nearly two centuries ago. Okay, so we've spent a little time in Edgefield, but it's time to head back to the American wing. A very different place than Edgefield, South Carolina. And yet, Seeing these 19th century Edgefield objects in the balcony cases with the other great examples of American ceramics and glass, it's really amazing because they really do belong. The same way that the large 1858 storage jar by David Drake looks right at home in the Civil War and Reconstruction Gallery and really brings that space to life, adding a whole new dimension. Of course, I can't help but wonder what Dave would think of his work now on display at the Met, in a gallery as longside paintings by Winslow Homer and Thomas Aiken, but I'd like to think he'd be happy about it. These 19th century alkaline glazed stoneware pieces from Edgefield District, South Carolina, really look right at home with the rest of the collection in the American wing. And they are helping to tell a far more inclusive American story, adding new narratives and perspectives to old ways of thinking. I am so thrilled to be a part of this research and this project, and I am very grateful to the Decorative Arts Trust, and of course my colleagues at the American wing and the Met, for making my work with them possible. Thanks as well to the Classical American Homes Preservation Trust for this morning. And I know that this was only a very brief overview of the work that I've been doing. So I hope you'll all come find me with questions afterwards. Thank you.